Thanks for joining us on Crime Watch. I'm Ivy Kano. Perhaps the biggest news on the crime scene comes from Oyo State, where a 19-year-old suspected serial killer has been rearrested 12 days after he escaped from police custody. But to arresting Sunday Shodikbe didn't come easy. While security operatives went to work on the front lines, we were told it took the backing of prayers, incantations, and rituals of religious leaders to secure the breakthrough. Now, the Inspector General of Police, Mohammed Adamu, has warned police officers in Oyo not to become complacent, having rearrested the suspected serial killer whose name has been linked to no fewer than eight mothers. The Inspector General of Police has also directed that officers must run a tight ship to bring the case to a logical conclusion. Crime Watch will be watching that story for you. Nigerians who put up obituaries of their loved ones on the pages of newspapers and other platforms may begin to have a rethink as criminals now use such information to target the bank details of their relatives. A seven-man gang is now in police custody after it was arrested by the police in connection with such activities in Lagos. It was a harvest of suspects as the Lagos Police Command venue of the briefing had close to a thousand suspects. From armed robbery, cultism, kidnapping and murder, the police had them on ground. This year's made Pareta Fisti. This venue made Pareta Fisti. Displaying different caliber of firearms and other dangerous weapons recovered from the suspects, the Commission of Police warned that his men are out to read the state of all criminal elements and miscreants. I'm not asking the kidnappers not to come to Lagos, but when you are coming, don't write your will for coming to Lagos. Because, so, whichever way, if you don't lose your life in the patio or you ended up in the correctional centers, what the loss is. So that's why this one ended up now. One case that stood out was that of seven-man fraud syndicate arrested in Lagos by RRS. According to the group, it was Division of Labor and Specialization, and each also has a splinter group. While one sources for SIM cards and account numbers, this suspect sources for foreign and local accounts for money lodgements. When we go outside, we look for a, a SIM card. Normally use it to, like, he will say, Okay, when you bring it, you ask you to bring money so that we can shake it from the bank for you. Okay, the one that this guy gave me is about just about four, four accounts. The dead are not spared as one of the suspects' duty was to scan through newspapers for obituary publications of prominent individuals, use bank insiders to determine the diseased account balance, clone their SIM cards for online transfers. If I get no number from obituary, I give them. But that is only what I did. The commissioner also spoke of arrest of a 72-year-old suspect said to be terrorizing satellite community and environs. The battle to keep underage girls from sexual predators is not yet over. This time, two underage sisters have found themselves allegedly impregnated by the same man, 57-year-old Ebenezer, a religious leader and founder of Church of the Lord of Israel in Abiyokuta. Well, the cleric warns the authorities to put the blame on evil spirits, but another accusation he faces is that he also duped the mother of the minors to the tune of 1.5 million naira. It was another successful outing for men of the Ogo State Police Command as they paraded suspects arrested at different areas of the state between July and August before journalists at the State Command Iliwiro Abeokuta. The Commissioner of Police Edward Ajogo said items recovered from the suspects include charms, locally made double barrel pistols, live cartridges, among others. He also warned residents to be careful of those using energy drinks to snatch motorcycles from innocent riders. The duo of spear pass dealers from Inewi and Anambra State, 40-year-old Chidi Ume and 28-year-old Obina Onyebuchi were arrested and the motorcycle discovered. It is interesting to know their mode of operation. Their mode of operation is that they will stop a motorcycle ask the rider to take them to a short distance destination with an offer of high 
We cannot fire off irresistible high fare. On their way, they will cause the motorcyclist to drive to a bar where they will pretend to be waiting for a business associate. If you see any Okada guy, just stop. Then I'll tell the Okada guy to take us to any hotel. Then I'll tell the Okada guy to relax with me, that I'll give him any amount. So maybe when getting there, maybe I'll tell him that I don't drink alcohol, that this is what I drink, energy drink. I will not give him the energy drink. I'll give him one of the energy drink, the one that was drugged. Then I will drink the one that was not drugged. The commissioner also warned those who are in possession of illegal arms and ammunition to submit such to the command, noting that the police would soon begin house to house search for illegal arms. Let me see this opportunity to warn those who are in possession of illegally acquired arms and ammunition to surrender them at the nearest police station to them. On his part, the accused pastor denied that he impregnated two sisters. I impregnated the sister, the sister. The one of them, the sister, that was what I, all what I knew after the agreement with the parents. No, I didn't sleep with the other one. I've been saying it. 37 of them were paraded by the Commissioner of Police, Ogo State Command. He noted that his men will continue to chase criminal suspects in the state and he will not leave them until they repent or they leave the state. The long-standing debate about how best to reorganize policing in Nigeria may have started yielding fruit. The presidency has approved the sum of 13 billion naira to kickstart community policing in the country. The initiative coming after weeks of mass killings in southern Kaduna, which led to international outcry, coupled with heightened activities of bandits in the northeast and northwest of the country. But just how far can this go? I had a chat with Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of Southwest Leye Oyebade on community policing as a possible solution to the rising insecurity in the country. Considering the vast country that we have with a heterogeneous population and looking at the wave of crime that is prevalent that varies within the geopolitical zones, so we, we need a, a community policing concept which will be adaptable, which is, which is going to carry the, the community along. It's going to be community driven because it stands on the tripod of uh, tra organizational transformation, problem solving, and police community partnership. And in that wise, it means that we're going to have people to be on board with us from even the locals the traditional rulers, the me members of the academia, the, uh, the traders, the yellowjers, and local hunters, as it were, from the locals. We're going to sit down together and work out how we're going to police the community. And it means that with what we have now, the structure is such that we are going to have community policing committee at the police post level, at the police station level, at the divisional level, at the area command level and at the state level. And then on top of it, we are now going to have an advisory committee that is going to oversee all. So i give you an example. If at the local level there is a, a, a kind of conflict between farmers and herders, it means that the DPU or the uh, divisional police officer at that level can summon the committee, bring the two parties, the warring factions together to a round table, and then in the classroom environment, they will judge you and look into it and resolve the matter. That's active, that activity is being proactive rather than being reactive. We want to prevent issues before snowballing into serious crisis so that we're able to communicate with ourselves. So all people that I've mentioned are the critical stakeholders and they will be brought together to participate in ensuring that we make policing more you know, community driven. We are now going to have community policing officers that are going to come up as auxiliary police officers. And the recruitment is going to be based on each local government the, throughout the country. 
the whole 774 local governments, the advisory committees that have been put in place now, they are going to be sensitized on how they are going to screen those that are going to be recruited. In fact, we are going to have uh, retired inspector generals of police that are going around all the geopolitical zones to assist in sending the message across to the members of these advisory committees. So the members of these committees are going to recruit those that are going to be recruited f to be the volunteer, uh, we call them auxiliary community policing officers. And so when the screen is over, they are brought together, trained and kitted and sent back to the local government where they come from. Because that's where they know the terrain, the topography, the language and the tribe and the orientation to be able to assist the police in gathering information, to be able to raise our intelligence level. They know the locals, they know where the shoe pinches, so they will be able to assist us. And these community police officers, mind you, are just people that have basic job that they are doing. So they are going to do this and they will be participants by the state government. There is a handbook on community policing that we have developed, and it is all encompassing. Everybody is being carried along. By the time it becomes effective, you find out that everybody will come on board. And I'll give you an example. Like this recruitment we are talking about, the local people are going to participate in getting to know who is going to represent or who is going to work in their environment. So that, that, is, uh, that is unique. And that is noble. So people that are going to serve with us are people that are of impeccable character, with integrity, and they are not just, just anybody in the society. So it's, it is everybody that comes that will we, we work with us now. And as it were, they will, they will function as police officers. You remember in those days, we normally have what we normally call Saturday, Saturday police, or Thursday, Thursday police in those days. It is just something like that. They will come and assist, and at that level, you find out that they know more of the environment, and they will collaborate and cooperate with the police in terms of assisting us to get to the locals, to be able to prevent, and to be able to get at the bad boys in their locality. Almost all the states in the country, we have inaugurated the advisory, uh, the police community police advisory committees. And the advisory committees are made up of all the critical stakeholders that cut across all these uh, sectors I've mentioned. The traditional rulers, members of the academia, the NGOs, the civil, the civil liberty organization, MBA, all the sectors. So with that committee in place, that committee is going to recruit. So nobody is going to be able to force any, any candidate on, on that type of a committee. The governors are going to be part of it, or his representative. Now, we now have, at the state level, at the area command level, and we still have at the divisional level and at the local level. So if issues are resolved at the local level and is not still well resolved, the advisory committee will advise that the matter be taken up, maybe to the area command level. The, the, the whole uh, concept is that we should address issues as they come up. If the trust and confidence is given back to the police and people are able to come back, this is alternative dispute resolution in a lot of the workings that we are going to be doing. Everybody will come and explain their issues. And if it is not resolved, we get to the, uh, uh, to the area command level. And if not, then to the state. The farmer has an issue with the other. And the, the farmer is saying the cost implication of what has been damaged is this. The committee will resolve. They can come and shift ground and ask, let's let him pay this. If they're able to resolve it, there will be no need for the other groups coming to support the group and making the whole, and, and, and the situation 
snowball into a, a, a lot of crises that will not be easy to manage. Bring everybody on board. Let there be that confidence that police will always bring everybody to a round table to really set with this, but not that all issues will go to court. At last, the mystery surrounding the killing of Uwaila Omozua in a church in Benin City, a do state capital, has been solved as police say they have arrested her killers. Parading the six suspects at the police headquarters, the state commissioner of police, Johnson Kokumo, said the police has been on their trail since the incident occurred on 30th of May 2020. The inspector general of police, Adamu Mohammed, had deployed homicide experts from the force headquarters in Abuja to work with officers of the criminal investigation department in the state to unravel the mystery behind the death of Uwaila. The CP says the suspects have confessed to their levels of involvement in the crime and will be charged after investigations have been concluded. Vera Omozua was attacked, raped, hit on the head with a fire extinguisher in a church which led to her death. Now let's bring you some other crime news. Chairperson of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabri Erewa, has warned parents against sending their children to schools in northern Cyprus. This is due to the incessant and mysterious killings of Nigerians in the breakaway state, which is not recognized by the United Nations, but only the Republic of Turkey. Mrs. Dabri Erewa stated this when she received a delegation at her office led by Justice Amina Bello, mother of the Nigerian student Ibrahim Khalil, who was killed in that country. She says Nigeria has no diplomatic ties with the country and it should be blacklisted given the number of students who have died mysteriously without any prosecution or compensation. She adds that the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice has already reported the matter to Interpol for further investigation. We are going to write the names of the universities out, put them in the public domain. It's not even about the universities, it's about that country itself. No Nigerian parent, I'm appealing to you, should send your children to Northern Cyprus, to any university in Northern Cyprus. There's a collaboration which we still don't understand. That makes them kill blacks, particularly our Nigeria students who are usually the most. So we work with you, madam, to ensure that we demand justice not only for Ibrahim, but for all those students that have been killed. And tell every parent, please, forget about going to school in Northern Cyprus. Yes, our country has challenges. Yes, there's strike. Yes, you don't know where you finish. But there are some of these universities that, I mean, you'll always regret that you even went to. Yeah. God Almighty has put you, and we have seen the passion that you have for to protecting Nigerians that are living outside the country, especially these children that have no, they have no backing in those countries, to help us and see to it that the Cypriot authorities are made, the Turkish Cypriot authorities are made to produce the result of the actual result of the investigation of on, on the murder of Ibrahim Khalil Bello. A 28-year-old wanted serial killer in Ogun State, Samuel Dosumu, popularly known as Spartan, has been killed by the police during a shootout at his hideout at Iperu area of the state. He was declared wanted by the police after killing seven persons at different locations at Ogere and Iperu Remo. Governor Dapo Abiodung has commended the efforts of the policemen in the state and other local security outfits that supported them in the search. Then from time to time, he would sneak out, machete his victim to death. Then he progressed in that manner to selective victims, machete them to death then dash back to the bush. So we employ the reactive means of always combing the bush each time this thing happened. Today, we were able to have a pinpoint uh, location of where he was hiding in the bush. And we engaged him. Uh, he broke bottles again, drew the cutlasses. The cutlass is in the 
uh, the vehicle there in case you want to see it, the one he had been using to hack people to death. Then, of course, we replied. Uh, we maimed him on the leg. Unfortunately, uh, it, turned out to be, uh, it turned out to be a fatal injury. So that's how we uh, were able to arrest him. That are still left in Ogun State know that we will not rest until we flush you out. We will leave no stone unturned until we flush you out and bring you to book. This state is the gateway state. We intend to ensure that we continue to provide that enabling environment for a public-private sector partnership, which we believe is very fundamental to the economic growth of this state and individual prosperity of you and I. And we will not allow any criminal to stop our effort in achieving that objective. The man alleged to have assaulted a female police officer and 12 others have been arraigned at the Yaba Magistrate Court in Lagos for alleged crimes ranging from serious assault, attempts to commit felony, and conduct likely to cause the breach of peace. The defendants, aged between 21 and 53 years of age, pleaded not guilty to the four counts before Chief Magistrate Oluwatoi Ogre on the 19th of August. They were each admitted to bill in the sum of 250,000 naira and are to provide two shorties who must be civil servants from grade level 8 and have landed properties as well as present their tax certificates dating back to the last three years. Family members of the defendants must also sign an undertaking on their behalf. Trial was adjourned to the 22nd of September. Nigeria Instagram celebrity Ramon Abbas, popularly known as Hush Puppy, has been arraigned in a court in California, United States, ahead of his trial on the 13th of September. He pleaded not guilty to four counts of conspiracy to commit money laundering conspiracies, wire fraud, international money laundering, and engaging in monetary transactions in property derived from specified unlawful activities. In June, the 37-year-old, known for an extravagant lifestyle on social media, was arrested in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, by special operatives of the Emirati Police and American Federal Bureau of Investigation. The FBI's investigation alleged Hush Puppy financed this extravagant lifestyle through crime. He is alleged to be the leader of a group that facilitates computer intrusion, business email compromise fraud, and money laundering. His targeted victims, majorly in the United States, had been duped for hundreds of millions of dollars, the FBI says. Rape is one of the fastest rising violent crimes in Nigeria. Here are some tips to prevent rape. Avoid unsafe situations and strangers. If you are being followed, go to the nearest police station or any place with several people. Avoid walking alone. Walk with someone in areas where other people are near. Stay away from dark alleys, bushes and entryways. Flee. If you are in a potentially dangerous situation, yell or scream to attract attention. You can carry a whistle that will make a loud noise. Engage in passive resistance by talking your way out of the situation or active resistance by reacting to startle your attacker. Don't allow a stranger inside your home use the telephone. Leave the outside lights on at night and in more than one room. And that's our program today. Thanks for watching. You can send in eyewitness pictures and videos to our email address and social media handles. It's coming up on your screen now. I'm Ivy Kano. I'll be back same time next week. Till then, do have a crime-free week.